Is it time to get started? Yay! Okay, well, good morning. Um, now, this one is a new piece of technology for me. So this time I get to beg forgiveness if anything goes sideways. Um, I am Mishika Guillory. Good morning and thank you all for joining us. I want to uh, put up the slide presentation for you guys to see what we're going to look at through the day instead of my face. And let me go ahead and share that with everyone now. So hopefully if anyone, if anyone can confirm for me uh, that you can see the slide presentation, that would be fantastic. Just with a note in the chat, I just want to make sure I've done this properly. Wonderful. Um, so you're here for introduction to commercial property management. Thank you guys, Kathy. And, and um, I think it's me too. Thank you so much, Salandra, Laura. Okay, Margaret, I'm seeing everybody in here. Um, and so you're going to get a quickie intro to what is normally a four hour class. Now, four hours with me means you're going to stay wide awake, which means this one hour is going to go by faster than you've ever seen before. Um, but I reserve the right for my chihuahua to interrupt this transmission. And I do understand sometimes when children and cats and dogs and the occasional spouse um, will you know interfere with what goes on. So I beg for the same forgiveness. But let's go through this, um, this presentation because these are some slides that were selected from the actual class itself, just to give you a little taste of the kinds of things that you're gonna learn. And, uh, and, and let me just tell you, this is a taste. I wish I could give you a full bite, but there's a lot that goes on in four hours. So let's hit it, guys. It's called commercial property management, and the rest of the title of the class is actually apartments not included. And I will explain that in a moment, but this does not cover apartments. So this is me. This is me when I bother to get dressed um, and put clothes on and look professional. My name is Michigan. I go by Mish. Uh, out in the world and I've been in property management and commercial real estate for about 20 years now. That means I'm old. My birthday is this Sunday. I turned 49 whopping years old and I'm proud of it too. But my property types that I've worked with, low rise, mid rise, um, office, retail, I've even done a mall, business parks, etc. I am the same lady that teaches the commercial leasing boot camp series through Texas Realtors, and sometimes I come through your individual boards to teach those classes. On the side, I also own my own real estate school where I teach the same classes, so I prefer you go through your board to get the classes so you can put money back in your own areas. And let's see, we also have a couple of other notations here. Uh, my portfolio of tenants, let me just show you people that I've worked with over the years, and I'll flash this up pretty quickly. Uh, Shipley's Donuts, Victoria's Secret, Chick-fil-A, and let me tell you, you don't get as many freebies as you think you do when Chick-fil-A is your tenant. Same thing with Shipley's. And thanks for the happy birthday, Shadana. I appreciate that. Uh, in my history, I've worked for big organizations like C.B. Richard Ellis, Trans Western, Jones Lang LaSalle. Those are some of the groups up there. And then uh, that's me. One more time, one of the other times I bothered to do my hair, coordinate my clothes, uh, featured in the Houston Chronicle. So there you go. Now, a couple of you, not all of you, but a couple of you may have said, hey, I've seen her face before. And some of you might have. Well, that's me, unfortunately, with a variety of hair colors, but it is all me. And where I tend to appear is on Fox 26 in Houston, working for a man that many of you know as the reporter with the bug in his mouth. That's him, Isaiah Carey. So I go on often to talk about real estate issues. But at the same time, I love joining my fellow realtors on their podcasts and broadcasts. And then I write for all levels of our publications, Texas Realtor, Houston Realtor, and even the NAR Commercial Connections uh, magazine. So I'm a pretty busy lady, but my favorite thing to do is to teach you guys. So just, let, just understand that we're on a one hour webinar. There is no CE credit, but I hope you hang out with me for just, what, another 50 minutes. And I promise you can get on with your day. Thanks everybody for silencing your microphones. And let me let you know this. We're gonna do our best to catch your questions as they come up in the chat. If you catch me skipping over a question, it might be because it's coming up next uh, on a slide and it may require a little extra information. So I may hold it until the end. 
If you are super shy about asking your question, that's my phone number right there. You can text me and I'll do my best to catch those text messages and just read the question anonymously. Um, and then your best bet is keep your questions short. No need for a bunch of background, just go straight into it. So here's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna teach you a little bit about the actual class that hopefully you sign up for. We're gonna cover briefly mastering tenant relations. It's literally job number two, not number one. Managing property ownership expectations. What it's like to do this every day. Um, some of the software you're gonna to need to do this successfully every day. And we're gonna discuss a little bit about one of my favorite subjects, locking out tenants. We have to do it. And then the Texas property code. So let's hit it. First of all, congratulations. You all took one of the best steps you could have taken. That's getting in this room. Take a look at the statistic that came out of the Tier Grand Magazine that was published earlier this year. They put this graphic out, number of revocations and suspensions from TREC, not Texas Realtors, TREC, which means they can revoke your license. So in a two year period, the largest category for taking back your license was acts or acts of negligence. Well, 33 of those are related to property management. And if you bother to go look on the TREC website under the category of disciplinary action, the first thing on the list, because I believe it's done in alphabetical order, is going to be an offense that cost someone a fine of $72,000. That's a seven and a two with a comma and three zeros behind it. That's massive. But one of the things you need to know is property management is not for play. This is a real thing. It means a lot to the investors who own the properties. So if you're going to dip into this, there's a lot to know and a lot of ground to cover. It's not simply fixing a, a, the occasional squeaky door and getting the rent collected. Those statistics don't include revocation for violation of agreed orders or the number of licenses that were placed on inactive status. So there's even more damage that was done. These are just simple violations. All right, so let's take a look and go back real quick at the human factor of what we do. So here's your purpose. You got six of them. First thing you need to know is if you're gonna do this, you have to change your thinking. You don't represent the tenant anymore. And I think we're accustomed to representing lots of people. The tenant, well, you're on the other side of the table now, my friends, you represent the landlord, unless you're contracted as the intermediary here. Also, the job is about managing and protecting the asset, that would be that building, so that it's profitable. Understand you gotta change all that mindset. This is really very much about the asset and the money. The next priority then would be rent collection. If that doesn't get collected, then we have not made sure this thing is profitable. But it's also key to know the landlord's process for rent collection, defaulting people, and doing lockouts. You could be doing your job wrong in an attempt to simply collect the rent. Also, you need to recognize and be comfortable with the idea that the bulk of your job is gonna be resolving customer complaints in the beginning. When you get there, chances are you've been hired because the person you're replacing, uh, well, either they did a stellar job, someone loved them and took them away, or you're replacing someone who didn't do a stellar job. And you're going to be resolving a lot of customer complaints in the beginning. If you don't do well with negativity first thing in the morning, don't do this. No one's calling you to say, you know, you did Shadana, those, those shrubberies are beautiful today. They're not calling you to say, you know, me too. I love what housekeeping did with the floors. They're beautiful. No one calls you to tell you that. They're calling because there's an issue. Then the next part of your job, you're gonna have to learn the leases. And this is where people cringe. Leases are deep when they're generated by your landlords. We're talking 40, 50, 80 page documents and your job is to study them and know them. Once a leasing person walks away and they're finished with the deal, you're there with that document for the next three to five years with that particular tenant. So it's key that you know what's in them. And then also they dictate your every move. So you can't move without knowing what's in them. 
And then you're gonna need to, and I kid you not, document every single move you make and don't make. This is a very litigious industry. You will be sued for something. And if you do not have documentation to prove what you did or didn't do, you're going to suffer and so will that property owner. So you're gonna to learn to document. But I want you to understand something, winning is hard. There's never gonna be a 100% satisfaction rate and quite frankly, that's all right. How do you get past that? First of all, you need to be sure to immediately report an unsatisfied customer to your landlord. And remember, we're talking the human factor of this job. You don't ever want a tenant calling your boss and your boss having to call you, it puts you on the defensive. When something goes wrong, you call the boss first and say, hey, look, I need to give you a heads up. You're getting a phone call from so-and-so. And it helps the boss understand the nature of the call, to be ready for it, and even to defend you when you were correct. The next thing you need to know, honey, if you said it out loud, you need to find a way to say it in writing and fast. That means if you had a conversation, a verbal one, then you go back and put an email together that says, hey, it was great speaking with you today. Just to summarize, we discussed blah, blah, blah. Shoot that off in an email. Hopefully they respond back to you and then keep that documentation. That way there is that written record of what you did and did not say. I've had to use that often. Keep paper or digital documentation. There are software that's gonna help you with that if you don't use the email to reiterate what you said. Also, notify security if necessary. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. I don't know where everyone is from, but I'm in Houston and I used to manage or be part of the management team of a notorious mall called Sharpstown. Now, if anybody knows the notorious nickname of Sharpstown, please put it in the chat. If I don't see it appear in the chat, I will put it in, in there in a moment, but let me say this. It was not an easy place to be. And so I did need to call sharp, um, security often, even when I dealt with my angry tenants. And yeah, I had to put a couple of them in jail. It, it's just part of, part of the business, depending on the property you're managing. Last thing you need to know, well, actually there's two points. At all costs, keep your cool. There's going to be no excuses, and I do mean none, yeah, someone hit it for me. Thanks, Shadana. You're almost there. I'm gonna, guys, let me skip back just real quick. Um, this is what Sharpstown Mall was called, if you look in the chat. And I hate to say this, but this was our notorious nickname because we earned it. It was called Shoot 'em Up Sharpstown, and we did have the criminal record to go behind it at that particular address in Houston. Very dangerous place to be for some people. But keep your cool. There's almost no excuse for bad behavior. And at the end of the day, this is also what's key, is maintaining the relationship with those tenants is what's important. This is supposed to be an income uh, revenue generating uh, venture. And if you're upsetting tenants to the point when they wanna leave and move, then you've not done your job. So here's some keys to successful tenant management. And these are some of my secrets. Key number one, as evidenced by the single key, Learn this one. If you give tenants exactly what they want, when they want it, it's likely gonna cost you and the property owner more money than it needs to. You need to learn to set the pace. Explain to people your process when you need to fix or repair something. That means getting bids and letting them know that I have to get bids for that and it's gonna take this much time, etc. Landlords do not let us run around free with the checkbook, that's not happening, guys. Uh, and then contractors are not always available. Look at item number three on this list here. They're not all available. Case in point, right now, many contractors have left our area to go work in Louisiana. They might be on their way to other parts of the country as well. So contractors that may start a job with you may need to delay a job. You need to learn how to handle that delay with an angry tenant. You must always learn to assure them, we're on number two right here, assure them that an issue is always a priority, even if it's going to take time. So how do you keep them calm? You call them daily. Many of us have a natural habit of wanting to kind of not talk to people until I have an answer. Sometimes the answer is there isn't one, but calling a tenant in advance and saying, hey, look, I wanted to let you know that 
You're not coming today because of such and such. When you beat the tenant to the phone, life's easier. As a matter of fact, you'll even find them calling you saying, hey, you know what? No need to update me. I really do appreciate that communication. Just give me a buzz when they're coming through and they'll say, hey, thank you. And then you can kind of knock it off. Number three, many of you live by this. If you're very successful people, you under promise and over deliver. Here's a quick example of that. Hey, look, it's gonna take the contractors about another two weeks to get out here. No, he said it's only gonna take five days. You up that to two weeks. That way, if they show up in seven days, you have still given the illusion of over delivering. And it's key in our business because it's difficult to tell with certainty when certain things will happen. And then item number four here, as evidenced by my four keys, you think now and you panic later. You don't get the right to panic now. You're the one who must keep a cool head when a building is on fire. Even at Sharpstown, when shootings happened, I had to go into a certain mode. I wasn't allowed to panic. When things occur, like people are trapped in elevators, you don't get to be claustrophobic. You're the one on the outside of the elevator. Stay calm, try to keep your people calm, handle whatever emergency is going on. Then when it's all over and you're out of the public view, feel free to freak out, but not on the job. And you are the one people will be looking at. So let's take a look at the tools of the trade. I want you to understand that when you're doing this job, you have to love Texas Realtors. There are 55 contracts available to you to do this job, guys, 55. And they're all at Texas Realtors. Um, TRAC does not promulgate any commercial forms. So if you're looking for a TREC equivalent, you will not find it. You will go to the forms section of Texas Realtors instead. And that's what TXR stands for up there, Texas Realtors. So I want you to take a look at this. And if you feel the need to photograph this or screenshot it, go ahead. But I do give this list away uh, when you take this class. But the list is designed to show you a few things. One, these, these, these forms are not under one massive category called commercial. Take a look at where I'm checking off my boxes. They're under every category virtually. The 1900s, that's for contract addenda and related forms. The BRA um, category, 1500s. Listing category, 1400s. So documents are scattered and you're gonna need to know where to go and what you have. If you're dealing with leasing, by far the biggest category, that's the 2100 category. FYI, this thing here in green, that's your commission agreement. Please get used to finding that sucker. And then this is, let me just show you, this is only one of the two pages. I can't give it all away, you gotta sign up for class. But the other half of this list is just as long and there is two total pages with all of these forms listed out for you in class. So let's talk a little bit about your software, what you're going to need to do your job. There's lots of stuff out there to use. And this software, just to answer a lot of questions people might ask, does it all. Yardi is a premier program. This is a preferred uh, program by a lot of people, but admittedly, it is expensive. But programs like Yardi and Yardi Voyager, this is one I worked with more so than Breeze, it was Voyager but they do manage to keep up with everything. All of your tenant phone calls, all of the work orders that come in, budgets, uh, cam reconciliations, everything that you need can be included in however you build your Yardi program. And they are customizable depending on what you need. You've got other programs like Appfolio, personally never worked in this one or VTS before, I just hear good things about it from colleagues. So you've got lots of stuff that you can use, but I do recommend using one because there's lots of tracking. And I do mean lots of tracking to be done. In class, we discuss another four or five different kinds. Some owners prefer to even use their own Excel-based systems. So you have to be prepared for what an owner wants you to do. Then we kind of get on down the line, guys, we boogie on down the line, and we get to the management agreement that Texas Realtors offers you. It's going to be TXR Form 2202. Go pull it up if you'd like to read over it, and I really urge you to read over it, but we go through it page by page in the actual class. 
But take a look at the kinds of things this thing will cover just in this one paragraph. This is the management authority paragraph. It does talk about who's collecting uh, and depositing the rents and things for the owner. There are, excuse me, are other paragraphs in the document that will even discuss if I'm going to collect rent or deposits, I have the right to keep them in an interest bearing account and keep the interest. Some people don't think about that, earning money off the money you're holding, but you need the right to do it before you do it. There are also things about, um, let's see, keeping a trust account because you're not allowed to mingle your money and we all know that. Um, things like expenses needed to operate the building and how we're going to disperse that money. Your ability to hire contractors. Who am I allowed to bring in and how much money can I spend at one time when I'm bringing folks in? How about killing these leases? Honey? Now look, we have tenants who do things they're not supposed to be doing. We have defaulted them to death. We've been nice, we've had meetings. And then there come days when we just need to get them out of there. Are you allowed to make that call? We discussed that in this form. And then there are other things in here. Institute and prosecute at owner's expense, evictions. And I did say that that was one of my wheelhouses. I do want you to know, just as a little sidebar, that we don't have to go to eviction court to evict a tenant for non-payment of rent. It's one of the things that separates us from the residential world. So you do need to have a discussion before you do it because it's the kind of thing that doesn't require a whole lot of paperwork. However, we go on down the line, uh, reporting payments, negotiating concessions. You know, what can you do on behalf of the person or group you represent? Authorizing certain people to be on the property, giving them keys, displaying and removing signs to advertise and promote the property, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff. And this is just one paragraph. This is a very, very deep, very well written Texas realtor form. So it's a 10 page document, covers leasing authority, record keeping responsibility, broker's fees, and even legal compliance. So we go over that in class as well. So what about some of the other things we go through in class? This is what you're really gonna need to know. Then there's that day-to-day -day stuff. We hit all the people stuff. Now let's hit the day-to-day -day stuff. The way the class is structured is we talk about things that happen outside the building. We talk about things that will happen inside the building. And then we go into how does that manifest at your desk? And so let me give you a case in point here. Landscaping. Landscaping is not just landscaping. Landscaping is all over the place. As we just said, take a look guys. This is the outside section of landscaping. There is landscaping outside of an office building. Of course, we know that. And what we do in class is we talk about the fact that grass is not just grass. We've got to deal with St. Augustine versus rye. Why? Because the rye grass is the winter grass. And right around now, maybe in October, we start sodding for rye. Why? Because when the St. Augustine dries up and dies, the rye kicks in. We stay green all year, but those are little things I expect you to know. Then you need to know things like annuals, perennials, what kind of flowering bushes and shrubs do we have on the property? We've got to deal with tree types. What do they need? Are they going to die? Do they need to be watered? All kinds of stuff. When your landscapers come in there, they start rattling off names. Do you know what they're talking about? What is a crepe myrtle? What the heck is an oleander? And you all know these plants. If you're in Texas, you know these plants, you've seen them. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show them to you. But you're going to need to get familiar with these things. Flowering kale, cabbages. Look, 15, 20 years ago, if you'd have come up to me and said something about planting cabbages, I would have looked at you sideways. So you need to get familiar. But that's the landscaping on the outside of the property. And just because I think these pictures are beautiful, we go over these in class. These are your crepe myrtles. They're all over Texas. We use them everywhere in commercial. This is your knockout rose. These things are beautiful, but for a very short period of time. You need to know that about your bushes. And these are your oleanders. We tend to have those around our wrought iron fences. 
It keeps visibility down when people are walking by properties. They can't see in so easily. Apartment buildings, just FYI, happen to love these. And then my favorite, azalea plants. They bloom for a very short period of time. They're green for the rest of the year. But this is the kind of stuff you're gonna be expected to know because at first glance, you may not realize we're looking at four different plants, but let's keep going. Now we need to hit the other parts of landscaping. We're talking irrigation. We're talking planters. What are we potting these things in? We're talking other concerns like pest control. Who's handling ant mounds? We're dealing with roaches. They like to nest outdoors and they're hanging out near the garbage dumpsters. What do you do when there's an actual beehive in a tree? You can't just knock a beehive down. You've got tenants to look after who may get stung and they're allergic. You got to get ready to deal with rodents. Are they digging up your cabbages? I don't know. Feral cats on property. They're in the landscaping. That's where they are. I've dealt with all of this stuff. When we're dealing with planters, those would basically be your pots. Guys, this is going to sound so silly, Miriam, but let me just tell you, and it's nice to see you, Miriam, by the way. I've made mistakes in the past. I brought out the wrong planters, and I have put out planters that were so lightweight that people stole my plants. They took the plant and the pot that I put it in, learned the hard way that there are outdoor ones versus indoor ones, which is why we have discussions about landscaping on the outside as well as the inside and then at the desk. And then things like this, take a look at where I'm gonna make this latest check mark. Your pop-ups, when we're dealing with irrigation, those are your sprinkler heads. Landscaping is going to come through your property with a riding mower and they're gonna to ride to their heart's content. They're gonna mow the grass. They're not paying attention to, nor can they always see through the high grass, whether one of the pop-ups in the sprinklers popped itself back down. So it'll get broken. You need to make sure little things are taken care of in your contract. Like how many of those are you fixing for free because you broke it? You need to have negotiated that or you'll be spending lots of extra money fixing pop-ups every week. It's key because when a pop-up breaks, water spews like an open water hose. And every night you'll be wasting gallons of water and then have to respond to an owner who's looking at you because the water bill's elevated. It's crazy how simple things become complicated. You'll need to know how to turn on the sprinkler systems yourself to test sprinkler heads. You need to know how to turn a building off and on completely. What are we going to do in a drought situation? You can't let that building go brown. You need to be prepared with drought plans. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But we've got lots to do. There's landscaping on the inside of the building. It's like, my goodness, we're not done yet. No, there's more. We now, now need to discuss the kinds of plants that do well inside, not outside. Is there lighting from the ceiling? Is there only fluorescent lighting? Yes, you're expected to know. If not, a landscaper might take advantage of what you don't understand. And then take a look at something I learned the disgusting way. I'm going to point to bum, 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 this nasty, fuzzy mess. Look at that. Take a real good look at that nasty, fuzzy mess that looks like white powder at the joint of a plant. Take a good, close look where I'm circling. Those are bugs. This picture is the blow up of the tiny little bugs that are the actual white mess you're looking at. Those are mealy bugs. I took over a property where a young lady didn't realize that's not just some powdery deposit left behind by the landscapers. Those were bugs that were accidentally brought in by the landscaper that didn't realize there was an infestation. Once these bugs hit a plant, you see all this fuzzy stuff next to the sides of its legs? It holds that in the air, just like a spider would a piece of its web, and it lets the air conditioning catch it and then float it on over to the next plant. Hence, we will have an infestation eventually. You need to know you're looking at this and then get the plants out of there. Then we've got those office buildings that actually have ground cover, the creeping ivy, putting mulch in a building. You all have walked into buildings that stink of mildew. Who's turning that stuff over? Is it in the contracts? You need to know that stuff. 
And then guys, these are my planters. Take a look at what I'm circling. I goofed early in my career. I thought these looked nicer, so I put them where? Outside. Y'all know these things are made of lightweight plastic, honey. I had the biggest plant giveaway in the history of plant giveaways in my parking lot because I put these outdoors and they were only designed to be in hallways inside of a building where we could arguably catch you running away. But nope, someone backed up with a pickup and took all my plants. So you do learn the hard way. But then other things will come up. Who's polishing the leaves to these plants? And let me just tell you, Brandon, if you're running a building that is an A-plus building, they're going to explain, uh, expect those leaves to shine, my friend. So yes, someone does need to contract to polish leaves. But at the desk, you need to make sure that you have differentiated between exterior contracts and covering all of these things we just ran through. Your interior contracts covers much of what's up there and then all these other things as well. How often are we going to replace the plants indoors? All kinds of stuff. How are we going to water the plants that are indoors? What are you gonna do if you mess up my carpet because you got water on it in the hallway? It's never as simple as just collecting rent, my friends. So let's keep moving forward. This is just an eyeball of what the contract would look like. Um, from the point of view of being at the desk. This is the frequency schedule for landscaping. And again, I'm just giving you a little taste. But you need to know in certain months, how often will certain activities occur? Because those services have a per occurrence fee associated with them. This lets you know when to expect people to come out, when they don't come out, and if they didn't, when are you gonna make that up because you owe me service? It's a lot. It's not difficult, but it is a lot to track. And this is but one of almost maybe 25 facets of your job. So this is part of what a contract would look like, but let's get off of that and move into something else. You're gonna be expected to understand HVAC and it's not an easy concept to grasp. You'll learn it over time if you've got a good crew. If your engineers, and your, um, the guys running your building, working with you, are kind enough to show you what they're up to. If you have contractors that will let you shadow them, you do that. You learn everything. There's no way to manage a building effectively when people are going to dictate to you what they're going to do. No, you need to have a discussion about what's going to happen, and the only way to do that is to get involved and learn it. So in my business, what you quickly learn is HVAC is just not that simple. That may stand for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, but you'll hear other terms, AHUs, air handler units, largely in office buildings. You may hear RTUs, rooftop units. You'll hear that a lot of times when we're dealing with retail centers. And just as a matter of explaining this photograph, these HVAC units that you see highlighted these are what someone like me might call an RTU. It's because it's on the rooftop. So that's what I'm referencing. You'll hear FCUs. Sometimes you'll hear these HVAC units referenced as package units. Very simply, it's because all components are packaged into one little box, one unit. When you get into office buildings, you'll hear about things like cooling towers, and chiller systems and water cooled systems versus air cooled systems. It is a lot to learn, but I find it very interesting. I love doing the work and it's fun. And on top of that, you really keep a contractor on his or her toes when you know what they're talking about. So let's hop over to another point of conversation that's really key, and that's your relationship with the fire department. You're going to need to have one. They're your friends. Trust me, they are. You need these guys, okay? But there are some pet peeves that unskilled property managers always manage to make. So I rounded up my buddies and I said, guys, let me have it. What do we do that really hacks you all off? And so they gave me a list. This is going to be half the list. They don't like it when we don't use things like Knox boxes on property. The Knox box, you've all seen it, but maybe not paid attention to it, I'm not sure, but it's a red box that has a little bitty circle barrel key opening on it. And inside that box, ideally, is either the master key that opens up all doors 
or every key for every tenant space so we can open up all doors. If you don't put the master key and even the card key to open the lobby doors of an office building, you give these guys no choice but to grab an ax and uh, crush your doors open, bust the glass open. If they really need to get in there, they're about to do it. But if they can use a Knox box before an imminent emergency is apparent, they'll do that. They'll open the doors gently. So put the keys in the boxes, guys. The FACP, you've seen these. These are the fire alarm control panels in the building. When they have bad battery backups and they're always being set off, they're notifying the fire department something's wrong. And they are only gonna come out so many times for free before they start fining you. But trust me, before a fire department starts fining you, you're gonna start getting some not so pleasant looks from the guys. I've had this happen to me before when one of my buildings, the owner did not have the money to replace that battery backup and he just didn't do it. Fire department showed up seven times on a rainy night when the FACP went off repeatedly. Do you know what it's like to stare down the barrel of, oh, a truck full of about eight ticked off firefighters who were still in their jammies because they know this is a false alarm? Not pleasant, my friends. So keep that thing fresh. Locks that do not fit the master key where they should be. This is a barrel key, by the way. This is the kind of key that would open the Knox box. If the locks don't fit and respond to the master keys, the firefighters can't get in. They are taking the door down or going through a window. Hidden signage and fire connections or totally inex total inaccessibility. That FDC sign must stay clear. We don't hide any of that with bushes and shrubs. They need to know where to connect their hoses from their trucks so that they can supply water to the fire hose that's inside the building. You do notice that those fire hoses are dry and they're folded up and they're hanging in the door. You got to get water to it somehow and boom, that's the connection. If it's hidden behind shrubs, what are they supposed to do? So those are some of their pet peeves, but we go through a lot more. And then take a look. The rooftop. Now this is an owner pet peeve. You not understanding a rooftop. It's literally the shield to everything. Everything inside the asset is protected by this single layer. And if you don't learn these things, you can literally have the asset ruined by water damage, mold and mildew. Even, even higher electricity bills because of radiant heat penetration. Lots of things can go wrong. And for the sake of being able to answer your questions, I'm gonna move through that one pretty quickly. But these are just different common types of roof surfaces. Um, some of the more common ones are gonna be TPO and EPDM types. So get familiar with these two. Take a picture of that if you'd like to get more details later or better yet, Sign up for class, push, push, push. And hey, thanks, Manisha, for the comment. I appreciate that. And then here's a quick quiz. I'd love for you guys to get involved and put this in the chat for me. I got a quick question for you, actually two. Why is the door handle on the left side of our screen uh, required instead of this door knob on the right in a commercial building? Why do we need this? What's up with the handle? Now I'll give you guys a second to type. I see locks from Laura. I see allows handicap usage from Donald Thompson. I see special needs from Margaret. Awesome, guys. Let me tell you what that's about. You hit it on the head. I'm going to give you a more specific, a little more in-depth answer, but um, Shalandra, um, forgive me if I say this wrong, Kyung Gim, it looks like. Thank you very much. Brian Montgomery, accessibility. I may give you a little bit more technical detail, but you're all correct here. This thing, again, is a handle, but it requires only two motions. The third motion that it doesn't require is called grip. See, a doorknob requires three motions. First, you must grip it. Then you turn it, then you push or pull the door. That's three motions to open the door. What if I'm arthritic and my hands are closed? 
fingers are stuck in position. What if I don't have hands? You know, my arm may have been blown off because I was serving my country and I've opted to just be me and not keep anything prosthetic to help me along the way. Well, I'm gonna need that handle because I only need two motions. Drop it and either pull it or push it with whatever I've got, you know what I'm saying? You can even use this in tandem with a friend if you need to, but it doesn't require grip to activate and turn it. And that's that extra key. It's a two motion situation, not a three motion situation. Second question on the table, guys, that was excellent. What's the name of the part that I circled on the handle? Right here, this little thing many of us are just kind of left calling a doohickey. What is the doohickey's name? And I can virtually hear some people giggling at the word doohickey. Trust me, for me, for about six years, it was a doohickey. My locksmiths just had to deal with me. You're close, Donald, with the jam. Very close, and I'm loving the spelling on that. Thank you. Anybody else want to go past doohickey, or are we all stuck on doohickey? Seriously. All right. <laughs> that thing is called a latch. You'll find yourself off. Ah, Brentley hit it. Got it, got it, got it. Technically, that's not the bolt, Robert, but I'm loving your guess because at least they would have known what you were talking about. But it is the latch. And oftentimes the latch doesn't connect or go deep into the door jam enough, Donald. And we find ourselves saying that the latch is broken. It doesn't uh, stay out like it should. And you'll find yourself needing to express that term often. So we do go over lots of vocabulary in class so that you can effectively talk to your contractors. It is a massive pet peeve of mine to be spoken through talked beyond when people are speaking about something that deals with the property I am managing. Last two things we're gonna talk about is electricity and a CAM reconciliation bill, and then we're wide open to whatever questions you have lingering. I want you all to just have this just because. Some people ask this question when it comes to electricity. What you all need to know in general is this, electricity always seeks to get to the ground. That's what it wants to do. That's even why in residential grounding of a home is important. You're trying to tell electricity, I know you wanna to get to the ground and the path you're going to take is this path that I'm going to give you. If not, electricity will arc over to something to get to the ground. It might arc over to you if something's not properly grounded. But wait a minute, why can birds sit on a wire and not get shocked to death. But if you reach up and touch a wire, granted it's close enough for you to reach to, uh, you'd be shocked. And it's because of what we just talked about, because electricity would continue its circuit um, and it would go through you to get to the ground. So they're not continuing the circuit, they're literally just sitting on one part of what needs to start a flow of electricity, but there's nowhere for it to go, so it does not flow through them. There's more detail in this particular slide, but let me give you one more example. When you're dealing with the battery and your remote control, you open up the back of your remote control and you'll notice that there is always a metal spring and there's always a flat thing that the battery must sit on. Your battery has a positive and a negative end. But when you manage to put the battery inside of whatever device you have in your remote control, suddenly, the battery has a loop that was created by the coil on one end and that flat contactor on the other. That loop runs through the actual remote control device and there's your little electrical circuit. There's that cycle running through the battery and through the device and that's how it gets its power delivered. And again, birds aren't continuing that loop. They're not touching a second thing. You want more detail? Read that whole slide. But I also want you to know we go through this in class. Take a peek. Don't try to study this. Sign up for class. You'll get the whole thing. But we even go through how to read your smart meters in the back of your property. Sometimes you're going to need to go back there and explain some things to the owner of the building. And we bother to take the time to teach you what all these signals mean on the smart meters that are even outside of your house right now. The most important one I can argue is probably on this page, guys. I really do want you to see this. When you go outside today, and I'm hoping you do, take a look and let this thing keep blinking because it's gonna go through these cycles 
and it's going to do a triple eight segment check. Take a look at that. What you want either display to actually show you is a whole bunch of triple eights. And if during the triple eight segment check, one of these things should look like a three or a zero or a nine, that means one of the segments is missing and there is a problem with the display, which could also imply that if someone manually reads this thing, they might accidentally be reading an incorrect code. So those are the, some of the things we actually go over in class. And then the last thing that we'll um, talk about here, and again, just giving you all tastes, not full bites, is I do take the time to explain to you because it is your job to collect money from these tenants and we have to discuss CAM, CAM billing and CAM reconciliations. And so we go over a lightweight version, but a CAM bill nonetheless to explain to you what a landlord's expectation is in collecting rent and even collecting money we didn't expect to spend, but now we still have to go back and bill tenants for and collect again. Sometimes, see, take, I want you all to skip all this stuff here. Take a look at what I'm gonna highlight in yellow. This particular tenant owes us $36,000 in CAM billing. They happen to have a giant portion of this property, but we had only collected 26,000 throughout the part of the year that they were there. Per this bill, this tenant still owes us another $9,700 you're going to be expected to know how to do this. We actually cover that in class as well. So with all of that said, now I have finished giving you the taste and we're here to answer any questions you have, um, but we're also here to tell you, please sign up for class through Texas Realtors or your respective boards. And what can I tell you that we didn't quite cover in case you wanna know if we do cover it in class? And let me take my face to take that off there. Here we go. Hey, by the way, you know what? Let me show you one more slide for those of you who may need to disappear. Let me give you my contact information now. Let me go ahead and put that up for you. Here you go. That's me. If you need to catch up with me, please take a picture of that and feel free to call me. But if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat um, so that we can get your questions answered and taken care of. And we're looking and giving people time to type. And by the way, I am available to answer the occasional question here and the occasional question there. But I will tell you guys, always make sure that you talk to your brokers if you're a salespersons. And if you're going to do this for a living, be sure that you have errors and omissions insurance in place and make sure that Make sure that you have a rider to your ENO insurance that covers property management activities. A lot of ENO policies do not cover it. Um, Mike Segovia, thank you so much. Shalandra, you said in the class. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions? Please give me a call. Put them in the chat. I'm seeing in class. Do you cover how to find clients? For your landlords, we can cover that, but actually that comes up in a different class. But of course, if you ask the question, we'll answer it for you in that class. It's actually pretty easy too. You're very welcome, Ms. Wynn. Uh, Manisha, why did the course say, not? oops, you know what, apartment's not included. I think I just got officially busted, y'all. Tell you what, apartment's not included because Chapter 93 of the Texas Property Code, and I'm gonna write this in the chat for you. Chapter 93 of the Texas Property Code dictates what we do for a living. And that chapter is only about the commercial tenancies um, practices, right? Let me just write this down, Texas Property Code. And commercial tenancies and the laws that dictate commercial tenancies says it will not cover anything that's considered a dwelling. Anything con considered a dwelling is under chapter 92. So we can't control what happens on a commercial property the way you have to control what happens where people dwell. Hence, we don't run apartments like we run commercial buildings. Did that get you there, my friend? Manisha, I mean, I got cold busted there. 
Thank, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I sure did forget to answer that. I'm looking, I'm reading the chat. Be sure to consult with chapter 93, your Texas property code. That'll get you everything else you need to know. Hey, Iman, I'm done. I'm relinquishing. Thank you so much, Mish. This has been such an informative um, class that you've offered us today. I can see from the chat that a lot of people enjoyed it. I enjoyed it myself. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, you know, I'm really, um, Margaret, what I'm going to ask you to do is this email me and I will tell you when the class dates are available because I do teach, this is a little nuance, through Texas Realtors, but sometimes your board will also hire us directly instead of registering through Texas Realtors. So give me a buzz, I'll consult my calendar, and I can show you even if your board is doing it or if you can join another board to take the class. Hey, Lindsey, Gary, Brian Montgomery, me too. It's all Zoom, by the way. Thank y'all so much. Hey, that was a quick class. Hey, Donald, I need you to know something, my friend. No one sleeps in my classes, ever. You will not sleep in my classes. That was cool, Iman. I'm scared to go. Hi, Cal, thank y'all so much. I'm scared to log off. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> we'll have to do this again then. This was so fun. This was great. Absolutely. Y'all have an amazing day. I see they are logging off one by one though. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, guys. Oh, I'm hanging out till they're gone. I Let's am. do it. Let's do that. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Yay. Bye, Robert. Jeez, makes you wonder if you were actually thorough when they don't ask questions and they just say, great. Exactly, that's fabulous. That's a well-taught class. Thank you, thank you very much. I run them through the ring. It looks like many, okay, we're down to about 12 folks hanging on with us and we're three of the 12. <laughs> Y'all have a great, great rest of your week, guys. Thanks again. And again, just as a reminder, the registrants, a link to this um, class. Oh, that's great. Okay. I think that was might have been the last. We're down to nine.